The idea of morphic resonance is basically that there's a kind of memory in nature. All self-organizing systems, molecules, crystals, cells, tissues, organisms, societies of organisms, galaxies, um, all self-organizing systems at all levels have a kind of memory from past similar systems that's transmitted across time by a kind of resonance across time. That's what I call morphic resonance. And so this leads to the idea that each species has a kind of collective memory of form and of instinct. And in that sense, it's very similar to Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, which is a collective human memory. Um, so in, in that sense, it's very similar. I didn't arrive at this through studying Jung. I came to the idea of morphic resonance when I was working in Cambridge, where I worked as um, I was a research fellow of the Royal Society and a fellow of Clare College in Cambridge University. Um, and I was working on plant development, plant morphogenesis, how leaves take up their form, how plants grow. Um, and I and my colleagues were at the leading edge of um, a mechanistic understanding of plant growth, plant hormones. Uh, there's a hormone called auxin. I worked out how it's formed in plants. And with a colleague, I worked out how it's transported in a what's called the polar auxin transport system. Um, uh, we were way ahead of anyone working in animal development. We knew the key molecules. We knew how they were moved around, etc. But I then realized that this just wasn't enough because all plants have the same hormone and the same transport system, and yet a fern leaf is very different from a hollyhock leaf or a beech leaf. Um, and uh, the, these hormones alone can't explain the form. Then I got interested in um, a well-established concept in developmental biology, morphogenetic fields, which are form-shaping fields, first proposed in the 1920s. Uh, the idea that there's an invisible field that shapes a developing organism as it grows. Each cell has its own kind of field. Each tissue has a field. There's a nested hierarchy of um, form-shaping fields. Um, and, this the, wasn't and, these, hmm? and, the, and these have actually held up pretty well because now there's a molecular model which is uh, carbon dioxide gradients, electrical gradients, and over time this has just become more more settled as a true phenomenon. Yeah, like Michael Levin's work, I'm sure you're aware of, seems to play right into this paradigm. Oh yes, Michael Levin is, is I know Levin, Levin, and his work is probably, he's the best modern representative of this point of view. Um, and so basically it's a top-down system of explanation. A field gives you a top-down way of explaining things. It's like if you want to explain the universe in terms of gravitational fields, which physicists do, it's a top-down theory. The field explains how planets and stars interact. You don't start with individual atoms and try and build up the universe from atoms. And with the electromagnetic fields, with the field of a magnet, you start with the whole field has a pattern and a shape. And the idea was that this top-down approach in biology is necessary as well as a bottom-up molecular type approach. And Michael Levin shows how uh, morphogenetic fields uh, could be expressed through electrical fields, electrical gradients, and so forth. Uh, I think he's doing very, very good work on, on uh, morphogenetic fields, and he speaks very persuasively about the need for this top-down explanation. Well, I became persuaded of all this, you know, when I was doing research in Cambridge, I was reading about morphogenetic fields, which was a very unfashionable topic in the 1970s. Um, and thinking about them, and I thought, okay, well, if morphogenetic fields, whatever they are or however they work, are shaping organisms, how can they possibly be inherited? Um, and they couldn't be inherited through the genes because genes, by definition, are not coding for structures or forms. They're coding for the sequence of amino acids and proteins or for the activation or deactivation of other genes. So uh, there's, I, could, I thought genes were grossly overrated and that they couldn't explain all of inheritance. Um, and so the forms, the morphogenetic fields had to be inherited in some other way. And I grappled with this for about a year and I just couldn't think how it would happen. 
Then I read a book called Matter and Memory by the French philosopher Henry Bergson, Henri Bergson, um, which was first published in French in 1896. And Bergson argued there that memories, our own memories, are not stored in brains, but there's a form of causation that works directly across time. And then I realized that the philosopher Whitehead had had something similar, and Bertrand Russell had talked in terms of monemic mem uh, causation, memory causation, that actually there was a whole tradition in philosophy of another way, another kind of causation across time. And it had to be based on similarity. And that led me to, in a sudden flash, I had this idea of morphic resonance. And, how, and then the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to be capable of explaining. Because, you see, I think that without morphic resonance, morphogenetic fields are very hard to explain. It's very hard to explain their inheritance. You have to say, I mean, I don't know where Michael Levin stands on this. He's well aware of morphic resonance. He's read my books on the subject. Um, um, but um, Well, we will definitely, he's coming back to the show uh, in a couple of months, so we will definitely ask him when we see him. But yeah, he's a, he's a very, very kind man and very thoughtful, and I, I love talking to him. He's he's one of my favorite oh, he's guests. He's great. He's great. I think I think he wouldn't probably want to commit himself to morphic resonance, partly because it would land him in a lot of trouble, um, <laughs> and, and, and partly because, you know, he'd want to see more evidence, and right now it's very hard to get the experiments done. So there is some evidence, but there's very few people in the world working on this. and. Um, because you can't get grants, you'll lose your job, etc. Um, there's one experiment going on at a university in the US I can't name, um, and the person doing the research who's a postdoc has to do it at night when there's no one around because he fears he'll lose his job if anyone discovers he's doing research on more what, what are the what are the experiments? Can you can you describe in broad strokes what that would look like? Yes. Um, According to morphic resonance, if an animal learns a new trick, um, say rats learn a new trick in New York, then rats all around the world in London, Melbourne, Australia, etc., should learn the same trick more easily just because they've learned that new trick. If lots of people do the word puzzle wordle this morning, um, when it's just been issued, it might be harder for them to solve it than people who are doing it this evening when millions of other people have done that same puzzle. So these are all predictions of morphic resonance theory. I've tried to get my hands on the Wordle data, but the New York Times now own Wordle and they're terrible spoil sports and, <laughs> and, and, and say, we are not interested in investigating this at this time. You know, they, they just, again, I suppose they prefer an easy life. If, if someone said the New York Times is doing morphic resonance research with their word puzzle, you know, that would be big problems for the games department and they just want an easy life. Um, but anyway, the, it, it's a theory that would apply to all animal learning, including human learning, and is potentially very easy to test, like with Wordle, because there's a replicate experiment every single day. Um, but in this particular case, the, somebody's doing experiments with the nematode worm Cinerabditis elegans, which is one of the main model organisms in uh, biological research. And with nematode worms, it's possible to train them to be attracted to certain chemicals. If you flavor their food with a chemical like benzaldehyde, which they wouldn't normally encounter in a pure form anyway, um, <coughs> you can train them, you know, a bit like Pavlovian conditioning, to be attracted to, uh, they go towards benzaldehyde because that means food. And if you do this over several generations, um, they go on doing it um, just without, you, you don't have to select them, it, it just gets sort of built in. And this is called epigenetic inheritance, the inheritance of acquired characters, which used to be a big taboo in the 20th century in biology. In fact, it was probably the biggest taboo. But now it's been rebranded epigenetic inheritance. It's a major topic of research, as you know, within biology. Um, well, the uh, the experiment I'm talking about is is conditioning nematode worms to be attracted to food with a particular attractant, so they get used to that. 
doing this for quite a number of generations so they become more and more attracted to it which could be an epigenetic effect there could be molecular changes and so forth um, but then then comparing control worms whose ancestors have never been exposed to it and see whether they've got more attracted to this chemical uh, because the others have learned um, than they would have done otherwise in other words does this spread to other worms in experiments with rats it's already been shown that rats that learn to escape from a water maze get over the generations get quicker and quicker but uh, it's not just rats whose parents have learned it's not just a molecular epigenetic effect rats whose parents have never learned of the same breed also learn it quicker when the others have learned it so i would expect that the same kind of experiment could be done with nematode worms um, the difference is that with rat experiments they take months or years whereas nematode worm experiments could be done in in a, a few weeks or months so uh, it's it's also a much more convenient model organism and it would be very good to have a morphic resonance experiment at the very heart of contemporary biology using one of the morphic one of the model organisms uh, and similar experiments could be done with fruit flies or, or other model organisms yeah or bacteria even they replicate so quickly that would maybe be a very fast way to get at it i'm beginning to see why people suggest that your work is dangerous to the heart of science because <laughs> this undermines this would uh, this would undermine pretty much everything from from the way that i see it because if all of a sudden one lab in you know omaha nebraska is doing work that is affecting the laboratory in cambridge there's almost no way to be able to tease that apart and it casts doubt on the entire endeavor of being able to say that these experiments are randomized and objective and somehow unconnected from everything else that's happening 